a bit longer, but last week we talked about, uh, started talking about Share Jesus. And, and if you're new here, these, this is our mission statement. Pretty simple, pray, share Jesus, grow, and repeat. Um, and these are all things that we can find uh, very much emphatically spoken about from Jesus and what he modeled. Um, and of course, he shared himself when he was walking the earth. Um, and so we base those things on that. And so we started back in, in December, the last Sunday of December, talking about uh, Ezekiel um, in, in a, pair, uh, a passage of scripture there, talking about the, the uh, water flowing out of the temple and out into the culture and so on and so forth. So we've been breaking that down. But in the process of breaking that down, we're, we're jumping into these things because it fits really well on what happened when that the, the river or the Spirit of God began to go into the culture. It changed the culture. Can I hear an amen? And so uh, we started last week talking about sharing Jesus. And, um, and I started with the first of four uh, statements that Jesus gave to the church from the time he was resurrected to the time he ascended. He gave four very specific statements to the church that we could say these are mission statements that he gave us. And the first one that we went through last week was the mission of we've been sent. Everybody say we've been sent. Okay. And so the scripture I used to, to platform off that came from John uh, chapter 20, verse 19 through 21. It says this, that Sunday evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in, in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Amen? Um, and then we took a couple, we looked at a couple examples in Scripture, one being um, running from being sent, and then the other one was uh, another example of somebody saying, send me, when the question was being asked, who should we send? And that, that was God speaking. Who should we, Trinity, who should we send? And that person said, send me. So you have Jonah, who was the example of running from being sent. And then you had an example of Isaiah, who was saying, here I am, send me. Um, and so great, great uh, Great examples of both, right? Because how many of you know God doesn't want us to run from what he's called us to do? He wants us to embrace it, and as we'll see as we get through these points, um, he's empowered us to do it. Amen? So if you will, again, say after, say after me, we are sent. Okay, let's make it personal now, because how many of you know that sometimes when we say statements as we, as a collective body, we'll go, yeah, we're sent. But truth, truthfully, we are sent is an individual thing, even though it's a collective. So repeat after me. I am sent. Thank you for making that I stand out. Okay, let's pray. Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, open my mouth, my heart up based on study and scripture and uh, what we have today. That, Father, we would grab a hold of your heart. And that, Father, that heart would become one with our heart. Father, help us to surrender to your will in our life and what you want to see us do as individuals and your church in the world today in Jesus' name. So, we've already established we are sent, but who are we sent to? It's a good question, right? I'm sent, but who am I sent to? So, where do we go for that? We go to Scripture. Um, uh, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, very familiar Scripture. We call it the Great Commission. And it says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So interesting there, there's a promise that God will be with us always to the end of the age. And the end of the age there is when God wraps up what we call earth, right? What we call life here on earth. When, it, when it's over, that's the end of the age. So there's a promise there from Jesus in this commission or this mission that he will be with us. And that's important for us to know because as we move on in these missions, we got to understand through and through that God is with us. He didn't set us up and go, ha, you're on your own, Right? But sometimes we feel that way, that we're on our own. But we're not on our own. 
because he is with us. And so let's, let's look at this. One, first thing I want to look at is he says this, all authority is given to me, right? That's another thing that's important to know, right? All authority has been given to you. How many of you remember when uh, Satan took Jesus out into the wilderness or Jesus went out to the wilderness and Satan tempted him? What was one of the things that he tempted him with? He took him up to that high pinnacle and he says, look at all the kingdoms of the, of the earth. It's all yours if you bow down and worship me, right? What did Jesus do? He came back, smacked the devil around with some scripture and didn't do it. Why? Because he already had all authority. He didn't need anything. He had all authority. And, and so it's, 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 it's good for us to understand all authority is God's. It's Jesus. And, and he, he's saying, all, because all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth, he's saying, go. This is coming back around to going, I'm, I'm sending you. But who, are we, who, who is he sending us to? He's he sending us to make disciples of all nations. Everybody say all nations. So to understand this, we need to understand that all nations isn't, wouldn't be something that we would be thinking about, right? Because they didn't have nations back in those days. They had empires. They had kingdoms. And so when he said that, they knew exactly what he was talking about for us in our world today. Because sometimes we look at words, words today and we decipher or dis discern the script scripture based on our understanding of the word today. But it's not the understanding of the word that they had. Are you following me? So when he said, I'm sending you to all nations, if you look that word nations up, it has nothing to do with countries with boundaries. It has to do, in the Greek, ethnic groups. So in, es in essence, what, what Jesus was saying is, I'm go, I'm sending you to all ethnic groups in all the world. And at that time, it wasn't as big as it is today, but the mission's still the same. God has sent his church out to all ethnic groups. So nobody's left out, right? There's not one person that's left out in that call to go or to be sent out to go to uh, make disciples. And so this, this phrase, make disciple in and of itself, everything is contingent on that. Everything that follows, like when he says, go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the, uh, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them all things that I've told you to observe, right? All the commands, right? All that is contingent on making disciples. So you following me? There's another thing about making disciples we need to understand. You can't make a disciple if you don't have a convert. Hello? <laughs> you can't make a disciple, a follower of Jesus, if you don't have somebody repenting. If you don't have somebody turning their life over to Christ, receiving the work of the cross and Jesus in as their Lord and Savior. That's the start. So our going to make disciples is also pre... pre, pre, pre uh, well, it's, to do that, you have to get somebody saved first to make a disciple. Come on. So part of being sent is to get somebody saved or to share Jesus and then make a disciple out of them. Right? How many of you know today that God isn't interested in just a convert? He's not interested in somebody just saying a prayer. Because saying a prayer doesn't actually make you a disciple. It makes you somebody who says a prayer. Here's the nuts and bolts of Christianity. God calls us to be made into disciples who are followers of Jesus Christ, who will, listen to me very carefully, who will allow his work of his Holy Spirit to change us to the point where we're now doing life the way he did life. And I'm not talking about eating manna. I'm not talking about eating whatever. I'm talking about doing his life the way he lived it. If we want to know what that looks like, all we got to do is look at the Gospels. All we have to do is go read the Gospels and we see the heart of the Father through Jesus because he did only what the Father wanted him to do. And how many of you would agree that when Jesus walked this earth, he walked in incredible love, compassion, and mercy, and grace. And we're called, listen, we're called, my son is freaking out back there, we're called to model that in this earth today. And as we model that and we do the things that he's commanded us to do, we become his disciples. It's interesting because even in scripture, 
Jesus was, was pronouncing a lot of woes, come on, woes to the Pharisees, right? And one of the woes that he pronounced to them was, woe to you Pharisees who travel land and sea to make one convert, which you make, and this is a real rough paraphrase, but that one convert you've made twice the son of hell before they became your convert. What was he saying there? He was saying it because the rules of the Pharisees were law, right? It was all about law and living by a law. God wasn't interested in, in the living by the law. He was interested in a relationship that would change us and not dedicated or, or pre, 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 um, I need some water. Um, not, not being focused on living by religion, right? Because that's what the Pharisees were. They were religious people. God's looking for, oh, thank you. That's my wife. Where am I? So we're to go to make, make disciples of all nations. Um, and again, it's, it's interesting because all nations means all ethnic groups. So let, let's, let's look at all ethnic groups for a moment, okay? I'm going to say a word right now, and I don't, I'm not meaning to say it to um, make any kind of a political statement. But if we could be honest in the church, and that's what we want here is we want to be honest. There's probably, probably prejudices that we do have. But when he sends us to all ethnic groups, we can't have prejudices based on people's ethnic, language, color of their skin, or the way they look. But let's be honest. There's probably things in us that we have prejudice towards people. Oh boy, we got real quiet all of a sudden. Let me give you an example. Maybe you have a prejudice against people who have tattoos. Come on. You can look at them and all of a sudden you have thoughts. And I can talk about this one because I, I've been there. And I'm just being honest because I should be honest, right? Because I'm asking you to be honest. I've been there. I used to have judgment against people who had tattoos. Okay, just being honest. But you know what? God did a work in my heart concerning that. And God's not interested in the outward appearance of man. He's interested in the heart. And so in the process of doing that in me, you know what I do now? I'm looking for tattoos. And I'm intrigued now by tattoos. And I'll actually ask people, hey, what does your tattoo mean? And you know what I find? There's something deep in what they mean. They're just not some random thing they do. There's meaning to what they're doing. Right? And how about this? Let's say somebody gets some tattoos that are like, oh, that's kind of dark. But they get saved. Do you know that that actually becomes a testimony of where they were and what Christ has done to them? Maybe they get a different one where now, now instead of, oh, now it's all bright and, and glorious. Right? But I had my own prejudices about that. Right? And so maybe you have uh, a prejudice in you when it comes to people who have piercings all over their body. You know the people I'm talking about that looks like they fell into a tackle box, a fishing tackle box? Right? Come on. We're just being honest today, right? Because there's so many things that we can have attitude about. And those attitudes get in the way of us fulfilling what God's called us to do. Go to all people. How, do you, how many of you know... Have you ever been around bikers before? Not, not like tricycle bikers, but real bikers. You know, burly guys that look like they just want to bite your head off and spit down your empty neck, right? Do you know that there's actually a ministry out there that focuses on, because they have a heart for those bikers? I don't have that heart. I, I, don't, I want to keep my head attached, okay? I, I, I don't want it being taken off before it's time, right? But there's people that actually have a heart to reach those people. And I'm thankful for those people. But in the process, I can't have an attitude about those because that is a person. That is a person that was created in the same image as I was before God. Come on, let's make this real basic today. Everybody we see is created in the same image I was and you were in, in God. 
They just don't know it yet. But we have these prejudice, prejudices that we go, well, you're not worthy. How about the homeless in the area? We've talked about this for a few years now, but it brings it up again. What about the homeless in the area? Do we think we're better than them? And because of that, we treat them poorly? Or because of that, we don't, come on, we don't love on them? I wonder if, if, uh, if there's something in us that could be honest in evaluating our own life, to say, if I didn't have Jesus in my life, where would I be today? Because everything's based on what we know in Christ, right? But where would we be if we were to honestly think, if you came to Christ later on in life, based on where you were at that point, if Christ never came in, where would you be? I think that's a very good question to ask. Because if we could be honest with that, maybe we might have a little bit more love, compassion for people that don't fit in our mold. Because we all have a mold, right? We hang out with certain people. We don't want to associate with other people. Come on, am I speaking to anybody today? We're talking about prejudices and how they get in the way of the mission that God's given us to go and make disciples. So we are sent. Come on, we're sent, number one. Number two, we're sent to all people groups, all ethnic groups. And we're sent with a very specific message. A very specific message. It says this in Luke 24, 46 through 48. It says, and he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah should suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the, in, in the authority of, this, of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. So what is, the, what is the message? So we're sent. We're sent to all people's group, but we're not just sent to go out there and say whatever. There's a specific message. And that message is there's forgiveness of sins if we repent. It's quiet today. I hope you're thinking. I'm hoping I'm challenging our, our thinking, our thought processes this morning. But we're, we're, we're to be focused, right? We're, we're to have, part of that mission is to be very attentive and, and, and things like that. And, and you know what? I'm all in favor of uh, modeling Christianity and friendship Christianity, but eventually, guess what? We do have to use words. Eventually, we do have to talk about Jesus. Eventually, we do have to recognize there's sin in the world, and the only way to get underneath that weight is to repent, ask Jesus into our heart. Come on, this is basic, I know, but why, why isn't the church doing it? That's, that's the question. Why aren't we doing the basics? But the message is very simple. And the message, <clears throat> in the message, to for, <laughs> there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent, is central to everything. It's the central message of the gospel, is there's forgiveness for sins when we repent. We see when, when, when Peter on the day of Pentecost and, and the Holy Spirit came, we see a boldness that came over him. And what was the message he preached that 3,000 people got saved? Repent, for there's forgiveness of sins. That was the message. And their hearts were ripped apart as they saw their wretchedness. Now, I'm not asking you to be Peter. I'm asking you to be you. But eventually, we got to start talking about Jesus and what Jesus has done. We got to start sharing our life. We got to we got to be part of that because it's very specific in what we're supposed to be doing. And can I ask your permission today? Can, can I ask your permission to let me be me? 
Because I want to say this. There's a lot of stuff in the church that are good, but it doesn't actually line up with the mission that God has given. We've lost the central focus of the gospel. We've lost the central focus of forgiveness of sins when we repent. We've lost it. We're busy doing a whole lot of other stuff in the church. And they're good stuff. Don't get me wrong, they're good stuff. Men's group is a good thing. Men's, men's outings to so hockey games are, are a good thing. Men's going river rafting is a good thing. But in the end, if the central message isn't tied in there, we've missed the boat. Women's ministry and all the functions that Kendall puts together are all great things, and we like to get together. But if the central theme of what God's called the church to be all about is missing, it's all for nothing. Are you following me? Now, dare I go to worship nights? I love worship nights. But if we lose sight of why we're here, we've missed the boat again. Listen, we all like worship nights and we'll continue to do worship nights. But all these things are good things. But they're not as good as they could be if the central message is missing in it all. Don't get quiet on me. It's easy to get distracted today in the church. Would you agree? It's easy to do good things. It's easy to, to focus on other things. And, and I believe that what's, what's going to happen in America is God's going to bring us back to the focus of the gospel again. The gospel of love, a gospel of grace, the gospel of mercy. Come on. We live in a time in, 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 in history of the world that God has given time for you and me, his church, to step in with the gospel. The gospel. The gospel. Um, Dr. Ed, Ed Stetzer says this. On the ash heap of history is a movement after a movement after a movement that, gets, that got distracted by something else and lost the gospel of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Think about that for a moment. And Dr. Ed, Ed Stetzer, he is an expert on, on church movements. He's an expert on uh, new movements that happen in the church. He's an expert on uh, stats and statistics and how they all get uh, how they get done, and how they tally them all up. He's an expert. He works, he works for the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. He's planted churches. He's, a mission, he's been a missionary. He does a lot of stuff. The guy is a brilliant man. He knows what he's talking about because he studied it. And you can look through history from the time of the early church to even up to today. Listen very closely. Where there's a pattern of new movements coming, and they, they have success, and then they get off the central focus of what we're there for, and guess what happens? They begin to dwindle and die. Because they lost the purpose of why we're here. They, they, they lost the purpose of that. But you could say right now, but, but you don't understand, Pastor, people don't want to hear about repentance. They don't want to hear about their sin. You're right, they don't. That's the world we live in. But if Jesus was here right now talking to you, which I am not, he would say, the mission to go, the mission of being sent and making disciples of all people has nothing to do whether the, the, the culture wants to accept it or not. Because they didn't want to accept it back in Jesus' day. Nothing has changed. So it's not like we can go, well, God, you don't understand. You don't know how hard it is down here. People don't want to hear it. And if Jesus would be so bold and talk like me, you'd say, so what? I didn't tell you if they want to hear it, I told you to go. I'm sending you because I sent my son. I'm sending you because you have a purpose to do. And, and I want you to make disciples. I'm sending you for a purpose. But unfortunately, the church allows the culture to dictate to us what we should do. How many would agree with that? 
I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the, of the culture telling us what we can do, what we can't do. I'm tired of hearing people say the church should just stay in the four walls of the church. Or, yeah, the church should just stay inside its four walls and have their little whatever they call it. I'm tired of people saying that because that's not our mission field. And we shouldn't take what the w culture says that we should do unless it's lining up with Scripture. We shouldn't take anything they say. If it's anything about keeping us in here, we should, we should step out with boldness. Why? Because he's with us. He's with us. Here's the thing. We can look at the culture today. And in all integrity and honesty, we could say it's messed up. And we could say with all integrity and honesty that if we were in the culture today, we would be messed up too. And we could probably say that to some point we're in the church saying we're, we're messed up still. Because there's areas we don't let God have that God wants desperately to clean and to root out, right? But the culture is lost in its own way of doing things. It's lost in this idea of do whatever feels good to you. Uh, the idea of you only live once, right? Remember YOLO when that came out however many years ago it was? You only live once. Do whatever you want. Do whatever feels good. But you know that, you know, as the culture embraces that, they're not getting any better. They're just getting deeper into bondage. And we see in our culture today that people are turning to drugs and alcohol to cope with all the hurts of this idea of do whatever feels good. It doesn't bring freedom. It doesn't bring peace. It doesn't bring anything that satisfies. It just leaves us empty and hungry for more stuff that's going to keep us in bondage. And it's all over the culture. And for us to think, well, they don't want us to do it. No! No! I think the reason they're there is because they're begging without words for the church to step up and get out. I think they're begging for something to happen by the church. But what the church does is it retreats with inside the four walls of the church, and this is what we do. We hunker down. Listen very closely. We hunker down in the safety of our own walls, feeling good, about a gospel, feeling good about worship in his presence, but it doesn't change anything really in us. We feel good. And so our Christianity becomes this. You only live once, right? So inside the walls of the church, if this feels good, this is what we need to do. At the expense of known missions of God. Are you following me today? at the expense of what God would have us do. So much the church can become this. It becomes this place where we're just seeking after, and allow me to use this word, presence, a feeling sometimes, at, the, at an expense to ourselves. And let me make this very clear. We want the presence of God. Because it's the presence of God that separates us from any other club in the world. It's the presence of God that sets us free. It's the presence of God that takes a sinner that walks in with bondages and breaks those bondages in worship and nothing having, having to be done outside of that. It's the presence we want. But God didn't call us to be present junkies in the sense of that's all this life is about is to chase after the presence. Listen to me very closely because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. We, we become so focused on that that we're not doing what God asked us to do. Do you know the Spirit of God's been moving throughout the earth ever since the day of Pentecost and His Spirit was released? It hasn't changed. It hasn't shrunk back. He's always been on the move. We don't have to go far to find Him. Matter of fact, I bet we could just go like this. Hey God, how are you doing today? Because He's right there. We don't have to go all over the world chasing something. He's here. And I'm not talking about this building. He's here, yes, but he's here. He's wherever you go. And going back to a couple weeks ago, we just have to tap back into the well. We have to tap back into the river of his presence and get into it. It's necessary, but watch. Getting in his presence should change us. And it should give us his heart. And his heart is to get out. His heart is to speak. His heart is to make disciples. 
But it's a travesty when the church is just looking to feel good at the expense of why we're even here. And guess what? I don't think God's pleased with that. We need to get filled up and get out. We need to get filled up and get out. And Stetzer says this too. Those who seek the gift without telling of the giver ends up on the heap of history. The ash heap of history. Get that right? Think about that. Those who seek the gift without telling of the giver end up on the ash heap of history. You know why? Because we're so internally focused. Allow me to say this because of a feeling we get. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. Understand my heart. We get caught up in, inside because there's a feeling that comes with it. And churches have died all through history when they become internally focused on just his presence and his gifts. Because you can't separate the mission that God has given us with the Holy Spirit. They don't get separated. We're the one who separates it. And so when we come into the presence, it should give us his heart for the lost. It should give us his heart for those that we are prejudiced against. Come on. We should have his heart in everything. So why do we come into the presence? It's not just about feeling good. Yes, we feel good. But we exchange the things in our life in his presence that don't line up with his heart. We okay? Let me give you an example. Maybe you don't know this, but Pentecostal Charismatic Movement is the fastest growing movement in the world. It's been like that for decades. We are Pentecostal Charismatic Church, right? But there's a, there's a problem. A lot of our roots to, to the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement started in Azusa Street down in California back in the 1920s okay that's where God was breathing on a on a place and, and it would be it wouldn't be something that you would be expecting it wasn't a big church it wasn't like flashy or anything like that a lot of poor people in that church but they just have, had a heart for God and God poured out on them and brought back the baptism of the Holy Spirit that had gotten lost along the way of church history and if you don't understand church history here, I'll give you a snapshot in 2,000 years. Early church started, power of God moving, people engaged with the mission. Man would get involved, man would stifle it, branched off to another place, they'd start all over. In time, man would control it, something would branch off, all in, all with it, man would control it. So all through history, we see that happening, right? So you come to Azusa Street, we're in a period of time again where things have been stifled, right? And now God pours himself out with the baptism of the Holy Spirit fresh and new on this little church. And culture thought they were whacked. Come on, they thought they were whacked. But you know what? They were passionate about what God was doing in their life. They were passionate and they went outside the walls of the church because they came into a fresh encounter with God. They got outside the walls of the church and began to share with everybody. Much of our, our, our roots that we have in Pentecostal charismatic movement comes from that experience, but it goes back to the early church, right? Because we see it in scripture. But understand this, the, charis or the Pentecostal charismatic movement is the fastest growing movement in all the earth, except America except America. And we could have many ideas, and many thoughts on why that is. But I truly believe that the church became me focused and lost the mission, lost the purpose of going to all people, making disciples, sharing a simple message of forgiveness of sins when we repent. See, when a church loses that, 
it dies. Because how many of you know it takes fresh life coming in to keep it all working? And when we get focused on ourselves and feeling good, come on. <laughs> Somebody's thinking right now, why did I come to church today? Because we need to hear this. And again, Ed, Ed's, Dr. Ed Stetzer studies church movements and what happens in them all. It also says this. He says, if you love the Spirit's presence but don't value the gospel's proclamation, it tends to last a generation, sometimes less. Did you catch that? If you love the Spirit's presence but don't value the gospel's proclamation, it tends to last a generation, sometimes less. presence is good it's our very source of life just like manna just like daily bread it empowers us but in the empowering we can't lose sight of the gospel message you know we love to come to church and we love to encourage and exhort one another and, and uh, say good things right how many, how many like that when somebody exhorts you and gives you a thank you, hallelujah, you did a great job? But how important for us to speak the words of life to people who are lost? How important is that? To God, it's up here. It's up here. To God, potluck, down here even though we'd all agree the potluck's really awesome. And we love it when people bring lumpia. Ponset. Kahlua pork. We love it. And it's good fellowship. And there's nothing wrong with it. But God's up here when it comes to his message of hope. So we're going to close there today <laughs> on the potluck. Um, there's one more, but I'm not going to get to it today. So we'll take it to next week because I have more to add to it. How's that? Can we, can we stand right now? You know, we have one more week left in our current fasting and I don't know what's happened during that time in your life and how effective it's been but can we do something as a church can we commit this next week to giving our all to that prayer and fasting I'm not going to tell you how fasting should look in your life. I'm just going to say we need to pray more as a church. And we need to pray more in our personal lives. And we need to connect with who he is. Because if we truly, listen, I'm going to say very, something very bold. If we truly love him, we should desire to have his heart. And his heart is to see those that are lost to come into a saving knowledge of who he is. Can we commit this week of, of praying every single day for ourselves and for this body that we would come to a place of being all sold out to the mission of prayer. More prayer is better than less prayer. And the mission of seeing the lost get saved. Even be bold to say, Lord, show me if I have any prejudices in my life that hinders me from loving people. Can we do that this week as a, as a church, as a whole? Is just commit to going, Lord, we want your heart.